But I'm very, very glad you're here tonight. My name is Phil Thompson. I'm the director of the Aquinas Center of Theology here at Emory. And it's our great honor to be able to present our speaker tonight, uh, Angel uh, Mendez Montoya, uh, who will be talking to you about food and theology in the Eucharist. So uh, it is also my great pleasure uh, tonight to introduce uh, the person who will introduce our speaker, and that is Rosie Gomez. Uh, Rosie is a former student of mine. She's now uh, a major power in the political science department here at Emory. Uh, coordinating, she's an academic coordinator uh, here, but she was a Catholic studies minor when I knew her. And she came to me and she said, I'd like to, to do a semester of directed readings on Catholic theology. And I said, okay, and what, what, what era, what time? What, you know, she said, oh, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and after I fainted for uh, and, and, and was revived uh, at the thought of trying to present all of Catholic theology in a semester, uh, uh, we then proceeded to uh, pick out some selections of Catholic theology for a semester. But she was wonderful to have, and it's my great honor to introduce her, to introduce our speaker, Rosie. Thank you. He was a great professor, did a great job explaining all of theology. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Rosie Gomez. As Dr. Thompson said, I'm an Emory alumna and also the, the second Catholic Studies minor to graduate. Very proud of you. It's my pleasure to introduce our wonderful speaker tonight, Brother Angel Mendez, and his uh, lecture titled Food Transformation and Participation Becoming Eucharistic. Uh, Father Angel is a Dominican cooperative brother from the province of San Mateo de Four and is quite a diverse and accomplished scholar. He holds a bachelor degree in dance and master's degrees, yes, plural, in philosophy, theology, and divinity. He received his PhD in philosophical theology from the University of Virginia and wrote his dissertation as a resident and scholar at Cambridge University in the UK. He currently teaches theology, philosophy, and cultural studies at several universities in Mexico City and gives lectures primarily in Mexico, Latin America, US, and Europe. He has published many essays in various anthologies and international journals such as Revista Christus, New Black Friars, and Concilium, to name just a few. In 2009, he published his book, The Theology of Food, Eating in the Eucharist, which since then has been translated into Spanish by Editorial JUS under the title Festín del Deseo, Es una Teología Alimentaria. His work has received great praise and raving reviews asserting to the importance of the topic and its unique contribution to the field. I'm quite excited tonight for his lecture, to hear Brother Anakin's unique insights on the connection with food and theology, to really contemplate on a deeper spiritual level something, something that is so common to us and that we often take for granted, which is food. No doubt his talk will be a great source of inspiration to all of us and a real treat, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Father, brother, on him. Thank you, Rosie. And I'm very grateful and very honored to be here, uh, especially with the other community of the Aquinas Center of uh, Theology and the uh, Catholic Cent uh, Studies of Theology. Is, uh, That's close enough. Yes, <laughs> Candler School of Theology. The school. Yes, at the Emory University. I'm very delighted uh, to be among you and uh, be able to share with you some food for thought <laughs> about something that is very close to my heart and also something that is very close to my own research, and that is uh, food and theology. Uh, some of you may be wondering what is the relationship between food and theology. And uh, well, in very few words, I can say that it's very central to theological thinking, especially to Christian uh, thinking and to Christian practice. Uh, but I'm going to develop more during my talk. But uh, I think it's important also to say something about my own uh, background and how and I, came, I became interested in this subject of food and theology. I think that all sort of theology has some uh, element of uh, biography, some biographical element even when you are talking about something that is very abstract and something that is very theoretical, like the Trinity and things like that in, in theology in this case, uh, there is something that, uh, in which we are personally involved as theologians. And so there is something that we also reflect from our own personal experience. 
in my case, uh, I, I became interested in, in the subject because of the, my own culture. I'm from Mexico, and uh, as many of you may know, in Mexico, family and community is very important. But all this happens around the table, actually. It's, uh, you're always, we always eat, and we always have uh, fiestas and celebrities, all the opportunity to, to get together around the table. And another way also to show hospitality in Mexico is by offering food to, to all the people. So if you come to a house in Mexico, they usually are going to offer you something to eat. And uh, you have to accept, and you have to say yes. <laughs> uh, because it's a, it's a sign of hospitality. Uh, also, my, my father was an excellent cook. And he loved to cook. He was not very extrovert, and he was more like an introvert person. But he expressed all himself by cooking food for others. And that was where you could see all his expression, all his, his love for people and for cooking. And that was the way in which he expressed who he was. And uh, so we had to, my brothers and sisters, we had to help him with my mother. To every weekend, we open the house to everyone, family and friends, and the friends of the friends who came to the house because he was such an excellent cook. And uh, and it was, I think, that was my first experience or my earliest experience of uh, God, my earliest experience of community, my earliest experience of what is hospitality and conviviality, uh, commensality as well as eating together and making hospitality with one another by the means of food. And uh, so I think it has to do with honoring my background, honoring my father, honoring my own family, my own culture, that I became interested in, uh, in, in the subject of food. Um, <clears throat> also, I was wondering, uh, when I was doing my master's uh, program, how, how could, uh, theology can become truly nourishment, uh, like a nourishing theology. Because at that time, and uh, some of you that probably have studied some theology, uh, sometimes it can be so abstract and so distant from uh, people's lives that uh, uh, sometimes I felt like it was too, too insipid to study theology and it was not very relevant to people's lives. So I was wondering how <laughs> Can I uh, explore the possibilities in which theology not only could uh, study and research on food and the relationship between food and theology, but also how could theology become a form of nourishment to people? And so that's why I started to investigate and to explore into this uh, rather uh, not very, very uh, common uh, subject in both in philosophy and theology. And so I decided to, to go into that direction. Also, my background before becoming a, a theologian and before becoming a Dominican, I was a professional dancer in modern dance. And so I also was very sure that I wanted to do uh, a research on, on the relationship between body, embodiment, incarnation, and theology as well. But in this, uh, in, in this particular area, I wanted to investigate more on, on the senses, for instance. What is uh, the sense of sight? What is the sense of touch? What is the sense of smell? What is the sense of uh, taste? And especially from uh, the perspective of theology. And, uh, and so I, I decided to go into that direction, even though at the time when I started to do my PhD studies, there was not much written both in philosophy and theology in the area of, of uh, food. And the things that were written were usually very negative and, and, and very kind of uh, disdaining and uh, discriminatory to the uh, subject of food. And uh, I'm going to say something about why was that in, the, in both in the philosophical and the theological uh, traditions. So that's the reason why I decided to go into this uh, subject. And it has been a really incredible experience. And I continue learning. I continue researching on this relationship between food and theology. 
Something that is very important about uh, food is that it's very basic. And I was surprised that uh, in philosophy and theology, there was not much development and research on, the, on this subject. And so, uh, uh, because it's really common to all, we need food to survive. And it's cross-cultural, and it doesn't matter what age you are, what religion, what class, uh, what kind of education you have. It's transhistorical. It doesn't matter in what, which time you have lived. All of us human beings need food in order to survive. So we are hungry beings. We are hungry. Without food, we perish. But it's not only that we are hungry, hungry for, for food. We are also hungry for relationships. We are hungry for, for being together with one another. We are hungry for justice. We are hungry for peace. We are hungry for, for many other things that are important in our own lives. So hunger is not only something physical, but it's not something that is also spiritual as well. And so that's, that's how I started to, to go into that direction and, and try to, to see what it means to, to research and to investigate on the subject of food. Uh, so there is a sense of transformation when we eat for food. First of all, the most literal sense uh, from a sense of lacking when we are hungry. There is a transformation when we eat because that gives us a sense of fulfillment or a sense of plenitude. Also, when we are hungry for relationships, and uh, because we lack the other, we want to be with the other person. We also are satisfied and we have a sense of plenitude when we finally achieve love, relationship, and we being with other people. And uh, so there is a sense of transformation when we eat uh, food. Um, so every act of eat, eating implies some sort of transformation and uh, the expression uh, that we all know, you are what you eat, is uh, very telling. Because we are transformed into that which we eat, uh, literally. So first of all, uh, in, the, in the physical level, in the very literal uh, sense of the transformation that takes place when we eat food, is, uh, is a great transformation because the food that we eat uh, is transformed into energy, is transformed into vitamins or vitamins, into proteins, minerals, and nutrients for the body and for the mind. Uh, body, the body can be strengthened by the food that we eat, or also it can be weakened by the food that we eat. We can get uh, uh, healthy and healthier by the food that we eat, or even die because of the food that we eat. So it's very literal, very radical, the transformation that can take when we eat food. But there is also other sorts of transformations that take place when we eat food. There is a, 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 a transformation in the state of the mind, for instance. Food has a, a lot to do with, with memory, for instance, when we smell uh, some dish or a particular uh, food, it can uh, trigger our memory and then uh, remember things that are, are very important in our life, in our family, in something from the past. When I was living in the UK, for instance, and uh, over there, food is not as important in <laughs> as <it is>. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's becoming more important because it's very cosmopolitan and it's one of the great places for gastronomy, but, uh, but at that time it wasn't really so important. And so sometimes I long to, be, uh, to eat something from Mexico because it reminded me to be near my family, near the people that I love in my own culture. And so it has something uh, to do with the mind, with memories, when we eat food. Uh, but also uh, there is a transformation of the heart as well when we eat food. Uh, we can become very happy after not eating for a while. <laughs> or sometimes it's not so much the food that we eat, but it's actually the, the people that we eat with and that can transform our, our state of the heart. And so become very, very happy and very enlightened by the sense of 
eating together with the people that you love and, and the people that love to be with you as well. In Mexico also we say that uh, to fall in love with someone, it comes first from your stomach. <laughs> so if you, if you are a very good cook, it's very probable that you are going to have very good uh, love relationships with people and people are going to love you because of the food. So you can also enlighten the heart by the food that you eat as well. So there's a transformation of the heart. Uh, I don't know if you ever have seen the movie Babette's Feeds. Yes. yes, yes. Wonderful movie, beautiful movie. And there's a, it's about an excellent cook that in one point she decides to cook at this lavish uh, meal in the, in the midst of a, a community that was in, in this point in a crisis. They, they were having all these problems with one another and there it was like a broken community. And then when she prepares this incredible meal, uh, she heals all the wounds by the, me by the means of the food that they ate and everything is transformed. There is a point in which uh, the book by Isaac Dinesen uh, says that uh, they immerse themselves into eternity. Mm -hmm. So you can even go into a deeper sense, not only of the heart, uh, transformation of your heart, but also the transformation of your spirit. Going from chronos, which is the measurable time, into kairos, the, the immersion of yourself into eternity of the sense of going into a higher level of consciousness and a higher sense of spirituality. That's why probably that most of the uh, religious traditions, whatever faith it is, have a very strong relationship with food and few food rituals, either feasting or fasting, and eating certain foods at a particular time, etc. Uh, they have a really strong relationship with, be, between food and uh, a communication with the sacred uh, uh, as well, or a way of in, in which the divine can become closer and more intimate to communities and to people by the means of food and the, by the means of food rituals. So there is a transformation, uh, physical, uh, also mental, and also uh, emotional and a spiritual transformation that takes place when we eat food. But there is also a sense of participation when we eat food as well. Uh, there are so many interconnections when we are eating food, even if we are not aware of the interconnections that take place. Even if you are eating by yourself, alone, uh, you are interconnected with other many other factors that are going on in this network of food production and food uh, labor and food uh, distribution and preparation. Sometimes it's, uh, I, I do this exercise, and I think it's worth doing it, all of us, to try to think how did the food came, came to, uh, into my plate? Uh, what happened for, for the food to come here? For instance, who cooked the food? Who went to the grocery store or whatever, to the market, to get the food? And then how did the food get into into the market, for instance, or into the supermarket, uh, where it came from, uh, who uh, harvested, if it's, if it's uh, plants, or, or what happened with the animal products, and how it's transported into one place uh, to the other. So we are participating, we are interconnected when we are eating food. And so there's a sense of participation with, uh, with the whole world. Um, we can also talk about the, the sense of participation and interconnections when we think about the geopolitics of food. Where, why is it that there are some places in the world where uh, there are so many people that uh, are malnutrition or they, they are starving, whereas there are other places where there is plenty of food and they even waste uh, food uh, a lot. Uh, for instance, right now, uh, we have 805 million people that are malnourished in, in the world. And then, for instance, in the US, there is uh, the 40% of the total food supply go to waste. So it's really the, 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 the fact of hunger is not so much because there is a lack of food. We have 
plenty of fruit to, to feed the mm -hmm. entire world. But the problem is that there is a, a, a sense of injustice, of inequality, and uh, the uh, speculation of the food industry as well, which is terrible. And the slavery sometimes that it takes place with the food production. <coughs> the other day I was uh, reading in the class of Carol uh, Newsom, mm -hmm. yes, in her class in the Old Testament and food. Uh, she sent this uh, uh, documentary from the LA Times and they were talking about the food, some of the food products that uh, they are eaten in the United States. In the United States, come from uh, Mexico, and uh, some of the Mexican farmers that they live like in, in literally like slaves, and some of them are children, for instance, that are working like that. Of course, Mexico has a lot to do with that, the Mexican government and the Mexican um, companies, but the, this land of plenty also eats most of the food from Mexico, and so it's the product of this uh, sense of slavery. Like uh, some companies, big companies like Walmart and Alberston and uh, other companies get all this food from, from there, from, from Mexico, and it's really terrible what is happening. So we are interconnected in, in one way or another with the food that we eat, sometimes directly, or sometimes indirectly with, with the food that we eat. Uh, then we are also not only interconnected, and the sense of our participation is not only interpersonal, but it's also uh, with the planet in which we live. It's an ecological connection or participation with the planet in which we live. Uh, the animals, for instance, what happens with the animals if we eat animal products? how are they treated, uh, sometimes they, they inject hormones and uh, all sorts of things that uh, makes them be very unhealthy for us when we eat them. Uh, sometimes I wonder if I should or we should become vegetarians, but then also in the vegetables there is a lot of problems sometimes uh, with labor work and also with all the pesticides and the transgenics and all these things, so it's really Sometimes we have to know what is happening with the food that we eat. Uh, the sense of participation also has to do with uh, sometimes building an uh, element of identity. We, we have an identity, cultural identity, national identity, by the food and the dishes that we eat. In Mexico, we are very proud because every single region in Mexico, they have different dishes, and it's a tradition that goes back <coughs> to many centuries and even to the pre-Columbian times as well. So it's, it's a sense of identity, national identity, cultural identity when, by the food that we eat. There are some national dishes, for instance, uh, here in the United States, I know that there is the, the turkey during uh, Thanksgiving, for instance, and then you immediately think about turkey when you're thinking about uh, Thanksgiving, for instance. No? And so they say this kind of a national <coughs> cultural identity by the dishes that you eat. Um, the, our sense of participation is a sense of belonging to one another, uh, our, our sense of being connected by that which we need. We need the other, whether this other is a piece of bread or whether this other is uh, the other person. But also, the other can be the planet and the other can be God as well. And that's why there is a really strong connection between uh, religious traditions and spirituality and, and food, the, the, the sense of sacredness of food that also brings us into a spiritual transformation. Here is very interesting because spirituality is not something disembodied. It's very interesting because food tells us something about spirituality that is intensively uh, physical, intensively material, intensively embodied, uh, uh, or what the academics say, somatic. It has to do with the body. So it's not something that is uh, a spiritual, like floating in the air, but it's actually uh, very intensively physical and material. And so there is a, a, we learn about spirituality uh, uh, that is completely uh, and radically embodied, radically incarnate. Okay, so I think that uh, these, all these elements, the element of transformation and the element of participation, 
make us uh, think about what it means uh, for us, especially those who are from Christian traditions, to think about the Eucharist, which is one of the most intense way in which God becomes present to us, God becoming food. And so I, I think that's also worth uh, thinking about what it means, uh, the Eucharist for us, and, and what is uh, food in this case uh, in the Eucharist. Uh, so if eating implies a transformation and participation at multiple levels, what sort of transformations may we need in the Eucharist, which from the perspective of Christian belief and practices is one of the most intense and radical gestures of God transformed into food and drink and in the context of a communal sharing, is God's love transformed into food to consume and to share? So I, I think I would like to explore a little bit into this uh, question. It is impossible to answer this question here with all the complexity that it has, uh, because the Eucharist is very plural, it's very diverse. Uh, even from one place that is near the other, uh, the way they celebrate the Eucharist is so different and can be so, so diverse. In Mexico City, for instance, where I, where I live, uh, we have so many differences. You can have a high church uh, celebration of the Eucharist in another place that is really more uh, poor. You will have a very different sense and experience of what is the Eucharist. And maybe this is the true Catholicity of the Eucharist, no? because it's both the local and the universal at the same time. So it's very plural, and, and I cannot uh, completely answer this question because it's so complex. It's almost like a polyphony uh, when we talk about the Eucharist. You know? the, uh, in the polyphony, is uh, you hear all these uh, sounds, uh, uh, but then all of them are different, and then you, you have one same harmony. Or maybe it could be kaleidoscopic, like a kaleidoscope, in which you see different shapes and different colors according to the community where you are. So I think the Eucharist is very plural and very diverse. And so I'm not going to suggest here a homogenized notion of the Eucharist, but, uh, but I, 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 I talk from my own experience as a Catholic. Uh, I talk in my own experience uh, also as a Dominican, in which the Eucharist is so important for us. Uh, this notion of the Eucharist is not uh, closed, uh, but it's uh, a notion that is open. And, and I would like to open this uh, table of discussion, and, and also uh, at the end we will have time to, to share and to ask questions, and, uh, and also to, that you can tell me also your own experiences with uh, food and your own questions that you may have. Um, but I would like to open this table not only within the Catholics, but also to other Christian traditions where the Eucharist is important. And also, I hope that this could, this could be inspiring, inspiring for other uh, faith communities that are non-Christian. Uh, uh, and also to the secular world, too, to those who don't have a particular faith, uh, because also food is important for, for all, of, all of us. So I hope that this is inspiring for all of us. Um, so yes, in the in the Eucharist, we uh, there is there is this sense of transformation that takes place, and and also if we look at the at the holy scriptures, at the Bible, we will see that food is very central in the whole history of the scriptures, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament as well. Uh, first, we have the the in creation in the Genesis, uh, God who creates the paradise and gives food to everyone. And then we have the ingestion of the forbidden fruit as a way in which we get out of the paradise. So it's also important for good or for bad uh, as well. And then uh, when uh, the, the chosen people of Israel, where they were in, in, in Egypt and uh, God uh, sends them to be free from Egypt and they go into looking for the for the uh, chosen, for the promised land. They are wandering in, in the desert and uh, they are hungry. And God doesn't let them go hungry, but sends manna as a way of also showing that he's a God that cares for his people uh, as well. And then we have in the book of the, the, the Deuteronomy all these prescriptions on food, 
what to eat, what not to eat. A lot of that has a, a sense, is common sense, depending in the geography, living in the desert, and what things are good and bad for them. And then also some passages in the Old Testament, uh, God is telling them the importance of uh, bringing hospitality and feeding the hungry, feeding the, the widows, those who are vulnerable, those who are foreigners as well. And so food is also a way of expressing hospitality. And then uh, in, the, in the sapiential or the, the wisdom literature books, we have the figure of Sophia, the wisdom of God, where she prepares an exquisite banquet and invites everyone to come to the banquet. And also she becomes food as well. She is honey, she is fruit, she is perfume as well. And uh, so we can see that in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, food is very important. And it's a way in which God communicates his love and his desire to be intimate with people, to intimate with people, to be closer to people by the means of food as well. And in the New Testament, it becomes more radicalized. It's not only the story of a God who cares for his people and feeds his people, but then we learn that uh, God becomes food itself. And, and Jesus, uh, he talks about himself several times about being the bread of life. And so we, we can see also how important it is in the New Testament as well. Uh, if we see uh, Jesus in the New Testament, in the Gospels, we see that he is always connected with something related to food. For instance, his parables, most of his parables talk about food. When he's talking about the reign of God, he uses metaphors that are related to food and to a great banquet where everyone is invited. And so food is also important in his talks. He also uh, perform some miracles that are related with food and so it's, it's really important. The other thing that is also interesting about Jesus is that he always was feasting and celebrating and having all these fiestas with people and he was criticized actually by, by, by the people of his time because he was always having all these <coughs> celebrations and fiestas with people, especially with the marginal, with those who were outsiders. Uh, so it was another way in which uh, Jesus broke the boundaries between who is included and who is excluded. So he, he invited to the table those who were excluded at that time, uh, the prostitutes, those who were the sinners, and all of them were invited into the same table. And it was really a scandal for many people at the time. At the Last Supper, he tells us that he is this uh, bread of life and he asks us all to do this in memory of, of him. And, but this goes back also to the Passover. So it has the sense of memory and remembrance of, of, the, of the Passover that the Jew, Jewish tradition celebrated when they were free from Egypt. So this sense of freedom, but it's also all liberation from slavery into, into freedom but also from death into life. And even the resurrected Christ is also eating with his disciples. In Emmaus, he breaks the bread, and that's when finally they recognize him uh, uh, as, as the resurrected Christ. And then uh, in, the, in, in one point when he's also resurrected, he has this, uh, there's this miraculous uh, uh, nesting of all the fish, and then he prepares this wonderful breakfast with, uh, with his disciples. So we also see Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, also emphasizing and underlining the importance of what is food for everyone. Uh, food in the New Testament tells us, and Jesus also tells us, that God desires to be close. So I, I think that the Eucharist is, is like the feast of desire, la fiesta del deseo, un festín del deseo because it is a way in which God uh, desires to be near, and also it is a way in which we desire to be close to God and to one another and to the planet. So the Eucharist is the feast of desire uh, because it shows that God wants to be closer to us and also invite us to become Eucharistic people. So the purpose of the Eucharist is not just to have a ritual, uh, a religious ritual, but the actual purpose 
of the Eucharist is that we become Eucharistic, that we also nourish those who are physically and spiritually hungry. And, uh, but then here's the problem that I see in contemporary world, especially in, as a Catholic, that I see sometimes in, in the church. I don't know if you have the same sense, but sometimes I feel like the Eucharist, instead of being a, a symbol or a practice of inclusion, is more a practice of exclusion. <laughs> How many people cannot partake of the Eucharist now? Mm -hmm. Because they are divorced, or because they are from different as, uh, sexual diversity communities, the LGBT, for instance. Uh, women, for instance, cannot be ordained, so they cannot going to the altar and consecrate the, the, the species of bread and wine. So actually, I wonder if we are becoming uh, like, a, like a anorexic church. <laughs> no, it's like there is the food, but we refuse to eat because we are not invited to the table. So I wonder if we are becoming an anorexic church. Or sometimes I wonder if we are bulimic church. <laughs> because we partake of the Eucharist, but then as soon as we leave the doors yeah. from the church, we throw it out. <laughs> and there is no implications of the ingesting of Jesus, of this food that we eat in the Eucharist, and the food that we eat in our daily lives, and our relationship with food, and our relationship with hospitality, and our relationship with one another, and with the planet. So I wonder if also we are becoming a, a bulimic church and also because there is this kind of great division between the private space in the, in the liturgies and the public space in the everyday life. So I think that the Eucharist challenges us as Christians and especially as Catholics to take the Eucharist into the everyday life, into the public space. It goes beyond the boundaries of the cult, it goes beyond the boundaries of the liturgy and transforms or tries to transform the world in which we live a world that hungers, both spiritually and physically. So I think that for me, the Eucharist uh, sets for us uh, a great challenge and unmasks who we are and, and tells us that we are still, we have to do so much still to achieve what is the Eucharist about. And so we are still very far from there. And I know that that's the case in, in the Mexican church sometimes with the leadership of the bishops that are sometimes are more in the side of the powerful and the rich, and many times they forget that in Mexico there is so much poverty and so much hunger. Only few bishops, uh, like Raul Vera, I don't know if you have heard about him, he is very prophetic and he is always working for things that are related to justice and also asking all the questions and trying to move uh, Mexico into a better world, into a better country. And so I, I also think that in the Mexican church, we are still very far from, from uh, achieving what is the Eucharist or the message of the Eucharist. So what to do? I, I think sometimes it's so overwhelming to think about uh, what is happening with food, what is happening with hunger. And, and, and then we uh, sometimes I try to solve the entire world, but I realize that mm -hmm. I cannot do it by myself. So I think my my way of uh, hopefully inspiring you is to start thinking about what is your personal relationship with food? How do you relate with food? Uh, where does the food come from? Do you also try to eat food that is organic? Uh, do you try to eat food that comes from fair trade uh, markets, for instance? Um, do you offer hospitality to other people? by the means of food? Do you make community with other people? Uh, right now, because all the, we live in a, in a world of computers and the internet, mm -hmm. sometimes we don't even communicate with one another. And we have this uh, planet with the fast food. And, and we forget the importance of sitting together with your family, of having uh, a great time with your friends, uh, with the food that you eat. And, and I think that's important also to have this time to, to make commensality or to make community with others by the food that you eat and the, the food that you share with others. Uh, what is the impact that you have or the food has in society and how to change all these destructive and unjust uh, food ways that we practice every day? 
So I think uh, there is uh, that Eucharist calls us to a metanoia, a change of heart. We have to have a conversion. And, and I think that's the main message of the Eucharist, that we have to convert ourselves so that we are closer to God's desire to be close, to be near. And so we can meet with God's desire and be one with the, our own desire to be close to God and to one another and to the planet as God wants to be close to us. Only then, I think, that it could happen the vision of the Beatitudes when Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Thank you very much. So now, I think it's really, really wonderful if we can share it at, at the table here, an <laughs> open table, and then, and then uh, ask questions or comments, uh, experiences that you may want to share uh, on this uh, very complex subject. And probably with this, we can animate the, the conversation as well. Yes. So, comment and question. Mm -hmm. uh, so, kind of like the you know, part of the reason I came over here is because. Okay. Hi. So, uh, part of the reason I came over here was interesting. This concept of food, I've been wrestling myself with an epiphany that came to me one time during uh, uh, during mass. Uh, you know, uh, Jesus used the word gana when he was, in, you know, talking about you have to eat my body. He said gana mm -hmm. was Aramaic for, well, like, take it, chew it. Chewing, chewing. Yeah, uh -huh. like, take it, yes, you know, chew it. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that was interesting uh, when we correlated with uh, Genesis. Here is, you know, how does the fall of man come? It comes through the ingestion of an apple. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't imagine any other way that eating an apple than just, you know, into it, you know. Right. Yes. Uh, I thought it was so. That's so. That's the comment, and that's the observation. How you know the fall of man comes through food, and and the nourishment of man also comes through the ingestion of the Eucharist. I, I can't think of a more symbolic way or a more beautiful way to make that connection. Sure. The the comment that I'm seeking clarification on is, uh, I like your metaphor. It's about uh, being uh, anorexic or, or bulimic. Uh, you know, very, very thoughtful and provocative, but at the same time, I'm, I'm hoping you clarify. You, you know, the the stance. You know, if you're pointing out to hypocrisy, hypocrisy exists everywhere. It's always has to the history of the church. So, the hypocrisy lies in the individual, right? I mean, per the church having a stance on what the Eucharist is and why people should not take it. I mean, that's pretty. Clear uh, and and you know, per biblical stance, it's, it's just harms you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you if you're not if you're not dressed properly to the wedding, it harms you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. clarify that for me because I what I was I don't know if you were just uh, questioning the stance of the church on that or evoking a metaphor in order to mm -hmm. make us be thoughtful about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's uh, the metaphor, uh, the imagination of. How can we create uh, Eucharistic celebrations that are more inclusive than exclusive? So I, th I think that's, that's the main point of the, of the Eucharist. And, and I think that's the challenge of, of the Eucharist as well. And, uh, and I think we have to move, still moving into that direction. For instance, with uh, the people that are divorced right now with Pope uh, Francis, he's making an effort to, to change some of the of these uh, canonical rules of the people that can partake or not in the Eucharist. So I think that we are moving into that direction, but we are still very far from that. Uh, and so I, I, I guess uh, we have to, sometimes we have to go back into the early church, perhaps, no? how, how they were sharing the food with one another. Sometimes the Christian denominations that are not Catholic I find them uh, like an, uh, the example, like the illustration for the way to God as well, because they are becoming more inclusive. For instance, they are ordaining women uh, as well. Uh, in the Episcopal Church, they just are ordaining uh, bishops as well. Maybe we can move there into that direction, which is very close to the early church as well. So it's not really become yeah, evidence of the early church having women priests. 
Yes, I mean, the, the, the Aconeses and, and people that were the equivalent, I mean, priesthood was something that was constructed uh, until much later in the church. So it wasn't really priesthood as such, was not in the early church. And so maybe perhaps we should go back into into the roots of, of what what it means to That's a beautiful opinion, but I don't think you really are are you are you historically pointing out to any specific cases that say here are some cases where there were women celebrating the Eucharist? Because I you know leaders, that would be news to me. Well they they were leaders of the church and uh, uh, probably they were also celebrating the Eucharist with the community and so probably we can go back to, to that time as well. Yes. I mean it depends. There are some historians and you have to go into all this uh, historical research and sociological research and archaeological research, but it's pointing into into that direction, most of the research as well. So, Thank you, I appreciate so, it. I, yeah, I, I think yeah. I'm more clear that you are sharing an opinion versus historical facts. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, the historical thought shows us that, that that's what is happening, no? the, the new historians. Sure. Your words and your heart uh, are very inspiring. Thank you, sir. To me, and I think to many others mm -hmm. in the room. But I am mm -hmm. a little disappointed that you didn't prepare this delicious Mexican food. <laughs> 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 yes. We can't partake of this. It's true, yes. You know, when, when I was writing about food, I, I realized how tempting it is for, for, for theologians to, to come into theory about food and not, and not be fully. So, it, but, but you know, my, my, my effort was in every chapter of, of my dissertation that is not the book, I start with something very concrete about food. I don't start with theory of food, yeah. but I start with something very concrete. So, in the first chapter, I talk about the Mexican mole with the recipe and everything. And, and so, every chapter is very foody in that sense, and then I reflect on that uh, theologically. But yes, I think the best context to talk about food is eating food together, yes, definitely. Uh, and yeah. one little uh, mm -hmm. question, insight. Right. Um, I'm very interested in how the connections between cultures mm -hmm. are really furthered by sharing, sharing meals. Mm -hmm. So we have really worked hard in our lives to reach out to other people to mm -hmm. learn recipes mm -hmm. of other cultures to share that food with them they point out mm -hmm. what is outstanding about yeah. that food and yes. then you get to understand, understand and yes. empathize yes. with people yes. and connect, view connect beyond the food yes it's true and it's it's like an international language because sometimes you can go to a place where you don't speak the language but then you communicate with other people by the means of eating food together so it it has this kind of uh translinguistic uh, sense of, of communicating with others by food, even if you don't speak the actual language. And you can learn so much about the other culture by the way they eat, and the food they eat, etc., and all these, all these things. So it's very important to make connections. Uh, I know that in the, the border town between Mexico and, and United States, like in, the, in, in Tijuana, there are so many people that they're not, they cannot cross the other way either because they are un undocumented Mexicans that they cannot go back to, to Mexico, or families in Tijuana that they cannot go into the United States. But then in the, in the border, between the, 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 all these uh, things that they have, uh, literally all these, uh, all the, the, the border, they send the tacos and the food, and so they make community, even the young borders. So you, you can also see that food has this capacity to break with the borders that we have put between one another. And by the way, I think that the, the main history or the main story or the message of eating the forbidden fruit has to do with putting borders between one another. I, I think that's the message. When, when uh, the, the eating of the forbidden fruit uh, expresses that they want to become like gods or more than God, they are trying to make this border between God and oneself. The man was next to the woman, so he is as guilty as the woman, and, but then he blames the woman uh, for, the, for the forbidden fruit, and then the woman blames the serpent, which is blaming creation, which is blaming God. So you make there a border 
between one another, between uh, ourselves as human and creation, and between all creation and God. So I think that the message of the eating of the forbidden fruit has to do with uh, making a border, uh, 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 making a, 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 a really a contrast, a juxtaposition between God and creation. I think that's that's the main uh, kind of message of the of the of the original sin. And, and yes, all uh, Felix Culpa uh, says uh, San Augustine when he talks about the Eucharist because he says. It is so convenient that uh, the sin came through eating of the forbidden fruit, and now redemption comes through the eating of the Eucharist. And so we are going back into the original of desire. Uh, uh, the desire is not bad in itself. It's actually good because it comes from God. But we have broken it because we make all these boundaries between one another. And so it takes us back, the Eucharist, into being with one another, into making community with one another. One bread, one body. Yes? I think I've been giving the mic. Um, I, I did like your pulling out the anorexic and the mm -hmm. bulimic, but mm -hmm. I also have to say, though, not everybody is ready for every food. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the church's teaching on who can receive, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to pull in analogies, mm -hmm. some people can eat a peanut, and some people have an allergy to peanuts. Mm -hmm. And then there's new thought about introducing children to themes, like introduce them slowly to peanuts so they can get over the allergy and receive. Mm -hmm. And I think when we include people to the church, mm -hmm. I think we're trying to include, but also <clears throat> say we have to introduce this carefully. Mm -hmm. Why? we don't give to children, we have parameters around. So I think, mm -hmm. I agree with your inclusivity, mm -hmm. but I think that it has to be, we want them at the table, yeah. but at the same point, Christ wants us at the table, but he also said, go and sin no more. It's not total inclusivity. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I just wanted to share just some great thoughts, provocative thoughts, right. and it's important to keep thinking about it. Yes, yes, I think, Yes, yes, we have to we have to continue working on that and and, and formation. It, it happens both ways. No, sometimes it is the, by the way of performing in the Eucharist that you learn, and sometimes it's also by learning that you also transform the performing of the Eucharist. So it's both ways, I think, and, and I agree. It's something that we have to do uh, little by little, but also it is the kind of the eschatological sense because of the eschaton at the end of the times in the omega point and the plenitude of the creation, there will be a great banquet, the, uh, the Revel book of Revelation and, and Jesus tells us. And it's a banquet of love too, a nuptial banquet. So maybe eschatologically, we are still but in the itinerary. The banquet, yes, yes. You know you have to prepare. Yes. To and we are in the way we eat, in the way we offer of hospitality to one another. That's how we prepare, yes. Definitely. Yes? As I was uh, reflecting on your comments regarding food and being mindful of you know, how we eat, I thought if we view food as gift, mm -hmm. then we will be more mindful. Mm -hmm. If we view Eucharist as gift, yes. then we will incorporate Eucharist and offer it. Exactly. And it must be accepted as gift. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I think we'll bring around an inclusion. Yeah. It is, it is, I think that the, the center of, of, of the Eucharist and food is gift, definitely. Yes, 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 yes. It's, it's a way in which creation gives us with the food so that we can be, we could survive, but also God is a way in which God becomes the gift uh, but, per excellence. No? In, but if which, I want people to appreciate gift, I have to model my yeah. appreciation of gift in yes. life, and that encourages yes. them. That in this case, the gift cannot be possessed, uh, totally possessed by you, but you have to share it with others. And, and so that's why Jesus breaks the bread and shares the bread. And so yes, <coughs> gift is about sharing with others, especially those who go without food, or even that are spiritually hungry as well, emotionally hungry as well. Yes, definitely. 
Uh, there is a question here and then another one here. So help to see. Okay. So help me to see if I heard you correctly. I think that you help us to see. You took us to a move, movement throughout your presentation. First, considering how the food is, is uh, produced. There's the food. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. There's food. Mm -hmm. How it's produced. Mm -hmm. Everything that is related to that. Yes. Yeah. It's in a way uh, calling to think about the social issues aspects mm -hmm. or environment, which sure. Pope Francis e ecological is issues. Exactly, yeah. which Pope Francis yeah. is about to, you know, give us another yeah. twist for thought, you know, mm -hmm. related to that topic. Mm -hmm. And then second, you moved us to the questions to ponder, how do we mm -hmm. personally relate to food mm -hmm. and that environment of food? Mm -hmm. yes. So all of those to me seems very human aspects for us to consider. Mm -hmm. And then it seems to me that you moved us to consider the aspects that are related to food has a Eucharist, mm -hmm. has a sacrament <clears throat> as such, mm -hmm. has a real presence of, of Christ, mm -hmm. and has a ritual. Mm -hmm. And then the third movement to me, it seems, is what do we do with that gift of food that we receive? Yes. Okay, so as you were giving up that, pre that presentation, which thank you, I, I think um, it gave me questions to ponder. Mm -hmm. Interesting Good. questions to receive and see how do I apply them <coughs> in my life, in my environment. Yes. Uh, but as I was hearing you speak, it reminded me the encyclical for, from um, John Paul II, Ecclesia in America, mm -hmm. uh, where he talks about the Eucharist as the source and the summit, the summit of Christian life. Yes. Okay, so mm -hmm. when you're speaking about in, being inclusive and being hospitable, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned at the beginning of your talk before you went to the sacrament of the Eucharist, about that you were not just presenting one specific view, mm -hmm. but what's the name of that little thing that gives us the different shapes? Kaleidoscope. I'm glad you guys can pronounce it. <laughs> okay, so keeping that one in mind, when you were talking about being inclusive and being hospitable, mm -hmm. it seemed to me that you went beyond the actual sacrament that a person receives, which is in, in Vietnam, it's very important, mm -hmm. but also how are we creating those communities mm -hmm. of faith, those communities sure. of inclusivity, and yes. those communities of hosp hospitality. Yeah. So you also mentioned and highlighted the values that our Christian brothers have in their, mm -hmm. in their churches, <coughs> and either regardless if it's the mm -hmm. women's role um, mm -hmm in their churches or mm -hmm. their Christian celebrations. Mm -hmm. But from your experience, would you mind sharing with us, how have you experienced within the Catholic Church mm -hmm. that uh, hospitality and how it has become, how it is also inclusive? I understand mm -hmm. that there's long ways for the Catholic Church also mm -hmm. to grow, I mean, mm -hmm. like any other Christian church. But from your experience, how have you experienced that inclusivity mm -hmm. and that hospitality. Can you highlight mm -hmm. that part of your experience as well? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. definitely. I mean, it's, it's uh, in, in Mexico, for instance, it's very important also to offer food to the poor. In the, in the moment when you uh, bring the offerings into the altar, uh, there are some communities in Mexico, and I know in the United States as well, that they offer food that then later on is going to be uh, offering to the community, especially those who, who hunger the most. So it's interesting because the sacramental, uh, that is uh, the actual sacrament of the Eucharist, is also around the food that is shared by the community and then further, goes further beyond the, the limits uh, of the private space of the, of the mass and goes into the world, into a world that hungers. So that's another way in which also we offer hospitality and we, we feed the hungry uh, with the food of the community as well. So this is another example in which we offer hospitality uh, both in the mass, but also beyond the, the liturgy into the public space. So this is another way in which we can offer hospitality. Sometimes also just uh, welcoming the other person that is next to you because there are some churches that you, you go into the church and you don't even know who's the other person next to you. you the most you, you share with the other person is a sign of peace in the moment of peace, but you don't even know what is the name of the other person. 
And so I think that some uh, communities and some churches, they make the effort to welcome those who are new, to when they introduce themselves to the community and they say their name. And then after Mass, again, there is this agapeic celebration when they, they eat uh, uh, some food and also they drink coffee. And so they offer hospitality and welcome those, especially those who are new into, into the church. And there are many other ways in which we can, we, we also uh, experience uh, the, the sense of hospitality within, within the church, both the Catholic church, but also the other Christian communities. When I came to Lourdes, the, this uh, church with the Dominicans go, which I love it. Uh, they, <laughs> It was wonderful. It was wonderful because I was new. It was my first time in the in the mass, and uh, and they ask who is who is here for the first time. Please stand up, and so we stand up, and then they gave us a piece of bread. So there you have it again, I and mean, it's another expression of hospitality by the means of food, by the means of bread, and for me it was a wonderful example of offering hospitality. When I was in, in a university, a Jesuit university in Mexico, in one town in Mexico, uh, it's a small uh, university and, and, and it's a small chapel. And I was really amazed by, by in the chapel, instead of having the normal altar and how is uh, the <laughs> settings of a church, all they had was a table with, uh, with, uh, with chairs around. So all the people, all the students, they sit around the table. And I, I know it could be an, not very practical for very large churches, but, but also I thought uh, how thoughtful that is because it comes across the message that the Eucharist is a shared table. And sometimes we forget it because I think sometimes we have fetishized the, the Eucharist to such an extent, extent that it doesn't have anything to do with the food that we eat, with the body that we are, with Christ uh, becoming incarnate, and with the sense of serving the world that is hungry. And so I, I thought that it was very a beautiful symbol of, of uh, table fellowship. That is exactly what is the Eucharist. Well, thank you. Um, definitely what you're mentioning right now yeah. um, is uplifting to remember and hopeful just remembering what happened last week with Pope Francis visiting the jail. And exactly, having, yes. You know, sharing that meal in the jail. Um, he is the relational all. aspect of the Eucharist that we are called. Exactly. And it makes me think, how am I being yeah. um, inclusive? Yes. Even though there's some we can do it. Yes, we can do it. I think, I think we can do it. And it's a call, it's a vocation. Prayer. It's a vocation to become Eucharistic, mm -hmm. actually. And I think Pope St. Francis is moving into that direction as well. Excellent. Thank you. Here's a question, and then <clears throat> so with all this talk, uh, so I don't know if you want the microphone. Here, I'll try it. <coughs> you can hear me. All right, good. Especially as long as you can hear the camera. I don't know. Um, with all this talk of food, there's also the opposite mm. of not eating, or mm. when purposely not eating, fasting. Fasting. Yes. Yes. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on. Is fasting important to the church? Um, yes. And why would somebody consider doing it, considering all these benefits of eating? And yes, yes, yes. I'm glad that you mentioned it because, yes, I, I think that fasting is another wonderful tradition in many ways uh, to remind ourselves of the sense of being in solidarity with those who hunger, for instance. I don't think that it's a private uh, kind of uh, uh, practice, but it's more like a public practice, a communal practice, because it reminds us of the world that hungers. And so I think that fasting has to have this purpose of being in solidarity with those who hunger, for instance. Or sometimes it's because we are so used to satisfy ourselves so quickly that we forget about the importance of also retaining, uh, about the importance of silence, about the importance of contemplation about the importance of discipline of our own desires as well and and sometimes it's just for the physical sense of not uh, that retaining from food and, and also abstaining from the food as well and and so detoxify ourselves in in that sense as, as well I mean it has many multiple layers 
the, the sense of fat, fasting and most relig religious traditions have uh, something to do with fasting as well. Yes, right now we are in the Lent uh, season and, and so I think that's also a way in which we are reminded of Jesus being in the desert, for instance, and, uh, and also that not only of bread alone we, man, uh, we the human beings live, but also of uh, God's word that is also as well nourishing, that there are other things that are nourishing beyond just the physicality of food. I'm on many other things. If I lived in Mexico, I would not be able to fast. Two more there. questions. Okay. Three. These are the final questions. Mm -hmm. So I uh, appreciate you giving me the word again. Thank you. And I do appreciate the dialogue here. Uh, yes. So you alluded to uh, almost like a Eucharistic estoppel that exists that excludes gays and alludes divorce and where um, in the Catholic Church, but it's not the case in other Christian communities. Yeah, I mean, so so you you're alluding to something like a Eucharistic estoppel, somebody out there. Where I guess what I'm asking is, uh, where <laughs> have you seen that? And and as you share this with his audience, again, are you sharing personal experience or are you sharing historical facts? Like, I just like to know the difference between them because it's one thing to to share personal experience that we all have seen it and, and maybe to share that. Uh, but I never, I never, I, I, I don't, as a Catholic, I don't understand what you're talking about. I'm like, when, 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 when I get up to, to church, you could go to many Eucharistic lines and dig the Eucharist if you wanted to. You know, I, I never seen anybody be turned away for the, from the Eucharist, although I've heard about it through political things. But what is it, what are you, what's it, what are you alluding to? I mean, where have well, you seen yeah. this? You just mentioned it. I mean, like, for instance, people who are divorced or people who are from different sexual, the sexual diversity, and uh, so that's that's one very particular case. The other thing is, for me, it's important because I have worked ecumenically in many places. Uh, for instance, last year I was in Wuppertal in Germany, and it's a Lutheran community, and and so I was the only Catholic uh, professor there. And, uh, and so uh, they, went, they invited me to several Eucharistic celebrations, and it was really wonderful to, to see it. What I realized is that maybe it sounds too strong, perhaps, I don't know, but we as Catholics, we don't have a monopoly of the Eucharist. Uh, we don't have a supremacy of the Eucharist. I think that we have to learn, I, I, and I think that the Eucharist itself is a way of showing the way in which we can become more and more brothers and sisters in the Christians, in the diversity of Christian communities. And so I, I think maybe what I will encourage you and other Catholics that have never been exposed to non-Catholic uh, uh, Eucharistic celebrations is to go and see, go and taste, go and share with other Christian communities and perhaps our understanding will be uh, uh, like larger and, and we will understand more the, the, the greatness of what it means that you guys uh, and, and learn maybe how to become more brothers and sisters with, with one another. But you never seen anybody at mass being turned away for the Eucharist. Yes. Yes. You see that. Yes. By by a priest, by a deacon, yeah. by I don't want to give names, but <laughs> even with Dominicans, uh, I had uh, I had an experience that was kind of shocking too. It was very kind of political and had to do with with the invasion of of, of when when the. 9/11 and and one of the, the the pastors said, well, if you are, if you don't agree with the policies of uh, Bush, you cannot partake of the Eucharist. And, and so that was really harsh for me to, to hear that. So it happens, unfortunately. But we are humans. I mean, we are all learning what it means the Eucharist, and I think we have to move into that direction. Also, in Mexico, uh, one bishop in, in a diocese told the congregation that if they didn't vote for the one who is now the president, who is extremely corrupt, mm. extremely corrupt, he said that they cannot partake into the Eucharist. So again, you can see 
that within the Catholic Church we have so much things to work and I think that's humbling first of all because uh, we have to have this process of conversion a process of metanoia as I said constantly reminding ourselves what is the main message of the Eucharist and, and that's fine I think that's growing in faith even if it's, it, it can be hurtful for us sometimes. And also, we make the church. I mean, we are a church, itinerary church. Mm -hmm. And so we, we also construct the reign of God. And so we can move into that direction as well. And so trust about that. And trust, uh, I think, uh, uh, some of you mentioned uh, Pope Francis, that is also showing a way in which we can become more inclusive, particularly with the Eucharist. So trust that. I, I think we can move into that direction, even if it's, it, we can feel afraid of the changes, but I, but I think there are healthy changes, changes for, for a greater community, for more human community, for communities that are more just. That's my personal experience. Yes? Hi, and thank you for sharing your views. Um, I'm not a Catholic, so it was very interesting to hear all mm -hmm. the so something that I was not familiar with. Mm -hmm. And um, as a Protestant, um, mm -hmm. we have a, a very we have a different view of the Eucharist mm -hmm. and the communion, as mm -hmm. we most uh, usually call it. Um, and since you m mentioned um, working with uh, those of the other uh, denominations have, and their and since our views on Eucharist differ, have you seen like the way are there the different views mm -hmm. affect um, how we view even like what you meant by the community, building a community? Yes, yes. I, I, I think uh, Walter Casper is he's in charge of the of the whole ecumenical uh, church, uh, all the ecumenical uh, dialogue in the different Christian communities. Uh, uh, he's working at, at the Vatican, and he is encouraging more and more to learn from one another, to dialogue with one another. And so I think that that's why I feel like. It's so important for me as a Catholic to go into different liturgies that are non-Catholic because I learn so much and, 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 and uh, you have a sense of making community with other uh, uh, different communities. And, and in that sense, I think that many uh, non-Catholic Christian communities are showing the way for us Catholics to, to move into into that direction, which is, at the end, if the direction is to become better brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me see. Oh, no. Sorry, yes. the last question. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, my passion is food, and Excellent. I love to entertain, and all are welcome at my table, and that's how yes. it's always been. And so everyone encouraged me to start my own business, and I had been a personal chef, but I didn't enjoy it because I was going into people's homes and cooking for them and teaching them how to cook. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed bringing people to my table. Uh, and I was the director of a nonprofit resettling refugees, and very <coughs> often to welcome them. Mm -hmm. I would have refugees, I would have members of our board of directors, mm -hmm. I would have members of the church, I would have students, everybody mm -hmm. would come to the table. Excellent. I made a mistake one day at church of stopping and talking to the priest in the parking lot, and no offense, but if you ever stop and talk to the priest in the parking lot, you will be given a job. <laughs> and when he found that I was new to East Tennessee and moved down from New York, and I spoke Spanish, mm -hmm. he just looked at me and said, do you speak Spanish? And I said, yeah. Hold on. He goes out with a stack of books, including the Bible, in Spanish. And I became the chair of Unity and Diversity to welcome the stranger. Mm -hmm. In East Tennessee, they were having a, well, it's not the only place in the world having difficulty welcoming somebody from another country. But there was a very big division between the American community and the Spanish-speaking community. And he said, how are we going to do this? So I went and I spoke to the Women's Guild, and they wanted to know if anyone available who could be their housekeeper. I spoke to the Knights of Columbus, three walked out and said, they're all illegal. I went to the youth. And I said, okay, for your youth mass this month, you're going to come to the Spanish-speaking ma mm -hmm. mass. And we're going to have a Thanksgiving dinner afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Spanish community, and I said, bring whatever traditional meal you would have at your table. Mm -hmm. And I told each of the kids to bring whatever bread represented mm -hmm. their culture. Mm -hmm. And nobody understood what was going on. And I said, um, they're Irish. Would you have Irish soda bread? 
tortillas, kaiser rolls, challah, you know. You know. Some people do have a Jewish connection in the family. And I put it all in a giant basket, and I had an American family, my own, which, by the way, my children, I have five children, and I realize the acronym of their name spells table. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, my God. Right. Um, it's not fun, um, but anyway, I had my children, and I had this family of Colombian refugees carry the basket up at the offering to, wow. to, uh, to uh, um, and the other. The, 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 to present the gifts. Yes. And I had written out for Father what to say, because nobody, I totally forgot to let people mm-hmm. know what the plan was. Mm-hmm. And it, the light bulbs went off when it was, we're bringing the bread mm-hmm. from our table mm-hmm. to the table of the Lord, who sure. is the bread of life. Exactly. And then we had this incredible mm-hmm. Thanksgiving feast. We gave away frozen turkeys. Mm-hmm. And it was the beginning, it yeah. opened the door mm-hmm. to the unity and diversity that we were seeking. Yes, mm-hmm. it took several years but from that we developed a hispanic youth ministry and then there was the integration and the assimilation and i just wanted to share that thank you very much for sharing that story we can do it we can do it thank you so much and well uh, thank you everyone And I promise you, you can ask it right afterwards, okay? You come right up to him. Yes. <laughs> We're going to give you a personal audience. It's actually for the group. What's it? It's actually Okay, one last question. No, but nobody actually, else, no. <laughs> it's it's yes. actually not a question. In my yeah, okay. faith group, we were given a website, because you asked a question knowing where your food comes from. Uh-huh, yes. There's a website called betterworldshopper.org, mm-hmm. and it, it will give you and grade all of the um, businesses, it will give you information in the five areas of social justice, community involvement like local farms, uh, animal protection, environment, and human rights. And they grade each of those companies uh, on a scale of A through E, uh, A through F. And like Chipotle, uh, you name them, they're on that list. So if you're shopping, you put your dollars in the right place. So it's called betterworldshopper.org. You can also buy the app for $2. But they have a book that I think is like ten dollars you can buy. So pull it up on your Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was well worth it. Thank you. She was over there like Anyway, thank you so much for being here tonight. Don't forget your assessment cards, right? Uh, please fill these out. Uh, and just leave them on your seat, or you can uh, hand them to Emma or Allison in the back there. Uh, thank you much for a very uh, honest, uh, interesting uh, discussion from a lot of different perspectives. I think we definitely got that. We talked about having unexpected conversations here at the Aquinas Center events uh, for the common good, and I think we had that tonight. So thank all each and every one of you. And thank you for being here. Thank you.